I'm Greg Egerton. I'm the Associate Director for Patient Care Service at the Birmingham VA Medical Center in Birmingham, Alabama. And I'm Doreen Harper, Dean of the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Nursing. The VA Nursing Academy is a partnership between the Birmingham VA Medical Center and the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Nursing that promotes educational and clinical practice innovations to prepare a highly competent nursing workforce focused on improving the quality of care provided to veterans and their families. This academic clinical partnership builds on the strengths, resources, and expertise of the veterans' health care system together with those of the School of Nursing to develop and enhance clinical care for veterans and their families in hospitals and community settings. This video production focuses on the needs of hospitalized veterans with mental health conditions who are receiving care in medical surgical settings. The video presents three clinical scenarios that depict veterans with common mental health diagnoses such as post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and other mental health conditions. You will see a less than optimal interaction between the nurse and the patient, followed by a critique by an interprofessional expert panel, and then another scenario with a more optimal interaction. We hope that you will find this video production useful to your clinical work both at the VA and other healthcare settings as we join forces to provide the best care possible for our veterans and their families. And now, on with the video. Thank you, Dean Harper and Dr. Egerton. We are now going to see three typical scenarios that occur when patients with mental health needs are admitted to a medical surgical floor. In part one of each scenario, the patient will receive suboptimal care. A panel of experts will then briefly discuss that care. At that point, after the panel's discussion, another view of that same scenario where the nurse applies more therapeutic behaviors uh, will be shown. But first, I want to introduce our panel of experts. To my right is Dr. Brandy Cook. Dr. Cook is a psychiatrist here at the VA in Birmingham. Sitting next to Dr. Cook is Dr. Tina McGinnis. Uh, Dr. McGinnis is on the faculty at the UAB School of Nursing and she teaches in the psychiatry division. Next to me, Mrs. Amy Barrow. Ms. Barrow is a staff nurse here at the Birmingham VA. Next to Ms. Barrow is Dr. Suzanne Fogger. She is also on the UAB School of Nursing faculty and teaches in the psychiatry division. And finally, Mr. Chris Offord, who is a staff nurse here at the Birmingham VA. Now we're ready to look at the first vignette. I'm gonna ask Amy Barrow to introduce the scene. Um, in the first scenario, you're gonna see a patient with a very rough and brash attitude. He is suffering from PTSD that dates back to the Vietnam War. This is very common for us to receive patients on the unit with PTSD. It's difficult for the staff to treat these patients because they may be angry or unwilling to accept treatment. Sometimes the staff has, have a tendency to take this too personally instead of giving, focusing on the patient. Thanks, Amy. Let's take a look at this video. Mr. Gamble, I need you to sit up and answer some questions for me, all right? Mr. Gamble, I can't get you the help you need if you don't cooperate, so sit up and talk to me. Get out. Get out of this room. Don't you talk to me like that. I'm doing my job, soldier. They've got you listed as PTSD, but this is not the psych ward, so we're not going to have any of that. You're here because of your foot, so why don't you tell me about that? I have complications from diabetes. I hurt my foot. Got infected. Now they're talking about cutting it off. Any other questions? Yeah, did you come here when you hurt your foot? Hell no. I don't need some doctor to tell me I cut my foot. Well, if you get hurt and don't get a professional to look at it, then don't act all surprised when it turns out to be worse than you thought. Yeah, like you care if any of us live or die. Bunch of parasites. Now listen. No, you listen. You sashay around here like some kind of queen, giving orders and getting off on your power trip. 
when these men in these beds are the ones who put their lives on the line so you can sleep safe and sound back here at home. And you know what? While you were off getting paid to be a soldier, I was working my way through college so that I could help people who are really sick, not people who don't have the good sense to go see a doctor when they get hurt. Get out of my room! I'll get out when I'm finished, mister. I have a job to do and I'm going to do it. Yeah, I've seen you doing your job, all of you, standing around talking about each other, outside smoking and eating junk food. You're great role models. Yeah, I know you guys think you're some kind of heroes, but you're not all perfect role models either, so come down off that high horse. Get out! Amy, as uh, you suggested, this man is very brusque, and in fact, he seems a little rude. Have you encountered a patient like that? And if so, what do you do? Yes, it's very common for patients to be angry and have a rude attitude coming in, especially if they have PTSD. We approach these patients, we try to be calm, you try not to rush the care, because patients can pick up on that attitude if you're trying to be in a hurry, and rushing them is not going to help your situation when they're angry. <clears throat> and just approach them with a calm attitude and try to remain positive and meet their needs. Thanks, Amy. Dr. McGinnis, can you identify where this nurse got off track with this patient? Well, she had very little empathy. As a matter of fact, I would say she has zero empathy. And she seemed to have very little awareness regarding uh, her own state of mind. She chastised the patient as if the patient were a child. And she was giving her rudeness right back to him that never ever works. The patient needs to be the center of her attention and if she's feeling rushed and thinks she doesn't have time to, to speak with him, make him the center of attention, then she's going to have to make time later to go back and provide the care he's really going to need. Thank you. Dr. Cook, this man was very angry. What do you do with that and what would you tell nurses to do? Well, I think that Dr. McGinnis makes a really good point that it's important to make the patient the center of the care that's being provided, um, validate the patient's feelings, um, make use of that chair that's next to the bed that we saw in the vignette, and um, have a seat, you know, put yourself at the patient's level as the provider of the care at that time, use a calm manner, show your hands, don't make any quick sudden movements because these patients can often have um, a lot of paranoid thoughts and things like this as well. So I would use a non-threatening posture. Thank you. Now let's take a look at this same scenario where this nurse utilizes a more therapeutic approach. Mr. Gamble? I'm Beth Allen. I'm the nurse who's taking care of you today. Go away. I'm sorry, Mr. Gamble, but I do need to ask you some questions about your foot. I'll only take a minute, I promise. I don't want to talk to anybody. I just want to go home. We're going to try to get you back home as soon as we can, Mr. Gamble. Right this minute, we're worried about you and we want to help you feel better. I'd feel better if I was at home. I guess it's always better to be at home. But while we're both here, I want us to do whatever we can for you. I always get worse when I'm here. It makes me crazy. You mean having to stay in the bed or? Hospitals. I hate everything about them. The sounds and the smells and the lying there, waiting for somebody to bring you a pill that won't help much. Have you always felt this way about hospitals? I don't know if I always did. I sure as hell came to hate them in Vietnam. I see. Were you in hospitals a lot over there? I got hit four times. Four different times. And I never got sent home. Just had to lie there until I was well enough to go back to my unit and get shot at again. It must be scary to be in a hospital again. It's not scary. It's just... 
I don't know what it is. I just know I hate it. But none of you people care. You're all so worried about malpractice and quotas and bureaucracy. But these guys in these beds, they're the ones who took the bullets. We're the ones carrying shrapnel in our guts for 30 years, 40 years, 50. And that's exactly why so many of us want to do whatever we can to help you be as healthy and happy as you can be. Because you deserve it. Well, never heard anybody up here talk like that. Or act like it. Yeah, I'm afraid we do get so busy sometimes that we do forget why we're doing what we do. Did that ever happen to you in Vietnam? You have no idea. Sometimes we got so caught up in the fighting and just slogging through that terrain. The politics didn't even enter our minds. You know what I mean? You had to stay in the moment. Yeah, right. The, we didn't have time to think about the big picture. And besides, that wasn't our jobs anyway. I mean, that's the way I see it. A soldier on the ground, his job is to follow orders. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't have a mind of his own. He does. But obviously, every kid who joins the service can't be in charge of every situation. There was this one guy in our unit. For the second video, I'm going to ask Chris Offer to introduce the scene. In scenario two, you will see a schizophrenic patient being admitted to a medical surgical floor. Sometimes I too struggle with these patients as I don't feel like I have the time to give them that they both deserve and need. This too sometimes can be very frustrating and truthfully at times I wish I had a little more attention to give to them. Sounds like it can be a little frustrating at times. So let's take a look at this, Chris. Okay, we'll take her. Thank you. I swear, one more thing and I'm gonna lose it. Well, I hope this isn't it, but ER called and they're sending up a psychiatric patient. Did you tell them we have plenty of people who are medically sick up here? That we've had three admissions in the last hour? All I know is, this is probably her now. I'm not gonna put up with much more of this. Administration needs to know we can only do so much. I've got Thank you. Now let's get something straight. We have people here who are seriously ill, and you are not to bother them. As soon as I get your paperwork done, you are to go to bed. This isn't like the psych unit where you can stay up all night and play cards. Look, just sit down over there until we get your room ready. Over there. Lord, when is the administration going to learn that mixing medically ill patients with mentally ill patients on the same floor just does not work? But are they going to listen to those of us who are out here on the front lines? Of course not. I guess that would cost money. They send me all this psychiatric language like I'm supposed to know what all this means. It says you're hearing voices. I understand that part. And they wrote you for Cyprexa. Is that what you've been taking at home? Cyprexa? Well, don't you know what medicines you take? I mean, good Lord, no wonder you're hearing voices. What's it gonna take for you, Charlie? How many times are they gonna have to rush you in here in a hurry because you're acting crazy and it's all because you skipped your meds? I'll get the Zyprexa for you from the pharmacy, but it's gonna take about an hour or more with everything else they've got to do. You just lie down here and see if you can't go to sleep. You can sleep in the clothes you've got on. They look like you've been sleeping in them already. Lie down then and go to sleep if you can. Whatever you do, don't get up and go wandering around the unit because we have people here who are medically very ill. They need their rest, and they don't need psychiatric patients wandering around the unit making noises.
Dr. Cook, do you think the portrayal of this patient was on target? Did this scenario ring true? And then I guess depending upon your answer to that, what um, should be the treatment goal for a psychiatric patient with schizophrenia on a med surge unit? I think that the, the portrayal of the patient was quite on target in this uh, scenario. These patients um, at times can appear to be very disheveled with poor eye contact, um, fearful and paranoid, um, have difficulty expressing their needs, and I think that the patient did appear to be that way uh, in the vignette. Um, and this can make it difficult for the patient to engage with the nursing staff and just let them know what they need. Um, I think the main treatment goal at any time on any unit is to ensure safety. So there should be some uh, assessment for suicidal and homicidal thoughts for this patient. I didn't see that occurring here. Uh, secondarily, to establish rapport to help gain the patient's trust so that the patient might be willing to resume that medication because it seems that non-adherence with the medication is the main factor that led to the admission in this situation. If the patient is willing to restart the medication even while on the med surge unit, it could shorten the length of stay once the patient is transferred to the inpatient psychiatric unit. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Dr. Fogger, can you talk a little bit about the nurse's behavior in this uh, particular scenario, and then I have a follow-up question once you address that. All right. In the sense that first impressions are really important, whether it be in business or in hospitals, and her first impression with that patient was that she was overbearing and quite frightening, and considering that the patient was having hallucinations, and they may have been a command form, there's no way of knowing, that her attitude toward the patient was such that it may actually make things worse. Thank you. And let me ask you the same question I asked Dr. Cook, but from a nursing perspective, what should be the goal of, of care for a patient with schizophrenia who is on a med medical surgical floor because there's no other place for that patient in the hospital? Well, I agree with what Dr. Cook said in terms of safety is your first priority. Uh, with this particular patient, assessing her hallucinations, as Dr. Cook said, getting her settled down, making sure that any weapons were removed from the room, um, were probably a good place to start in forming an alliance as with the patient to kind of get them to feel as if they were safe in that environment would be really helpful. Thank you. Chris, uh, that nurse was a little bit over the top. And I guess I would ask you, have you ever seen behavior like that? And if so, what do you do about it? Unfortunately, I have, although it's not as common. Um, I think the main thing that you have to do is to pull that nurse aside and make them aware of how their projection of their feelings onto the patient can actually be jeopardizing that patient's life and safety, um, and as well as the standard of care that they, that they do deserve. Um, so just letting them know what we're here for is the patient and maintaining their safety at all times and providing them with the care that they deserve outside of what we're feeling at that moment. Thank you, Chris. Well, I think those were all great responses. Now what I want to do is take a look at this same scenario. And in this scenario, we'll see that Nurse Baker provides a more therapeutic approach. So let's do that. Okay, we'll take her. Thank you. I swear, one more thing and I'm gonna lose it. Well, I hope this isn't it, but uh, ER called and they're sending up a psychiatric patient. Well, did you tell them we might not have room for her right away? Because she may be better off somewhere else for the time being. All I know is, this is probably her now. I've got it. Thank you. Miss Jones? I'm Janet Baker. I'm the nurse who'll be taking care of you tonight. Will you tell me your first name? Ch Charlie. Hello, Charlie. Can you tell me where you are? VA Hospital. That's right. This is the sixth floor of the medical unit, floor six. We're going to get a room ready for you, OK? Well, it may take a few minutes, so you can have a seat over there until then. All right? Yeah, OK.
So Charlie, do you know why you're being admitted into the hospital tonight? I have these pills, but sometimes I forget to take them. Now I've been hearing voices in my head just like the last time I didn't take the pills. Well, tell me about the voices. They say that I'm the devil and that I'm bad. So when you don't take your medicine for a few days, you begin to hear voices that tell you you're the devil? That you're bad? Yeah. That's what happens. Well, that sounds really scary, Charlie. So you did the right thing by coming here. We're gonna do everything we can to help you feel safe, okay? Okay. Now, the people in the emergency room say they have you on file as taking 20 milligrams of Zyprexa. So I'm gonna go get that from the pharmacy for you. But I need to know you're not gonna hurt yourself or leave the unit. And can you promise me that? Yeah. And what are you promising? That I won't hurt myself and I won't leave the unit. Good. Well, I'll go right now and get that medication for you. I'll be back in about 10 minutes. If you need anything else while I'm gone, just push this button and someone will come check on you as quickly as they can. Do you understand? Yeah. When will I be back? Ten minutes. You're already doing better, Charlie. I think you're going to be just fine. You just lie there, try to rest until I get back, okay? Do you want the light off? No. I need it on. Okay, then. Well, just close your eyes and rest. I'll be back with your medicine, and then you'll feel much better. In the last scenario, I'm going to call upon Amy again. Amy, um, in this scene, the patient appears pretty hopeless. And I'm going to ask you, do you remember a patient like this, or patients like this, who seem to be just very hopeless about their situation? Yes, Dr. Keltner. Uh, many times the patients we receive are very sick. They come to our unit, obviously, or they would not be in the hospital. And while they're here, they don't receive very positive news. It's very difficult for not only myself, but other nurses to deal with this appropriately because you don't want to give them false hope and be overly positive, but you also don't want to damper any incentive to fight the disease and to do all they can do to get better. So uh, we would love some tips on the proper way to care for these patients. Thanks, Amy. Well, let's take a look at this scenario that we are entitling Hopeless. today. How are you feeling? I'm feeling like somebody with pancreatic cancer that's spreading everywhere fast. How do you think I'm feeling? Well, I don't know. I've never had pancreatic cancer. It feels like I'm probably going to die in here. And I'm wondering, what's the use of lying around in here getting sicker and sicker? Oh, they're going to fix you right up. Don't worry about that. I know it seems hopeless now, but listen, when I was in middle school, I was playing volleyball and fell down the wrong way on my ankle sprained it really bad. I had to use crutches and go through rehab. Oh, and that was the worst, the rehab. I thought over and over again, how to just give up, you know? Get used to being on crutches or in a wheelchair. But I stayed with it, and here I am today. So I don't see why you I can't. need you to get my pain meds, all right? That's all I'm asking for. This hurts like hell, and your jabbering is only making it worse. I'm only trying to help. You don't have to get rude about it. Besides, you're not scheduled for another round of meds yet. We don't want you getting addicted to those things. I am tired of hurting. Can you understand that? I'm tired of there being nothing in my entire world except pain. Oh, I'm sure there are good things in your life too. Yeah, really? My wife left me. My son hates me, my parents are dead and I'm being eaten up by cancer. Tell me what the good things are. Well, there are good things, I'm sure. You just haven't looked for them hard enough yet.
Frankie. Was that your patient, the man in 289? With the pancreatic cancer? Yeah. Why do you say was? He's dead. Suicide. What? They just found him. He hung himself in his bathroom. We hear a great deal about hopelessness and suicide. And I'm going to ask the question, has anyone on the panel actually been working on a unit when, some, when a patient took their own life? I have. Okay, Dr. Fogger. Uh, it was an overwhelming experience, a feeling of, of failure and of loss, because we were responsible for protecting this patient from themselves, and we failed. And in that process, the overwhelming feeling that there was nothing you could do to change that was something that sticks with, it sticks with me all for the rest of my life. Well, thank you. I've had that experience, unfortunately, as well, but I cannot add to what you've said. Now, Amy, I want to ask you, do you have any thoughts about what you've just seen here in this video? Yes, it appears that the nurse is making the afternoon about herself instead of the patient. She's not effectively assessing her patient for any suicidal risk. At that time, she really needed to question him further and see if he had a plan, but whether he did or not, it's always a good idea to put a mental health consult in, let someone in that specialty come speak with him and provide a someone to observe him at all times. Would have been her best action to take because you would rather overreact instead of under, underreact because you can't go back and change things when something tragic has happened. That's absolutely true. Dr. McGinnis, I would like you to break down that nurse's actions, and I particularly uh, was particularly fascinated by her comparing her junior high school ankle injury to this man's very, very serious condition. And I couldn't help but wonder, was she just trying to avoid the reality of his situation, or was she just particularly dense? She showed a remarkable lack of self-awareness. I believe that every nurse is charged with being therapeutic and using himself or herself therapeutically. She was dismissive. She chastised him also, argued with him, and did not make the patient the focus of her interventions. I'm also amazed that she did not get the messages he was clearly sending. He's feeling hopeless. He's feeling alone. He is in terrible pain. And uh, nothing she did promoted his psychological comfort. And it, I believe that actions definitely speak volumes. If she had only sat down for a few minutes and made him the focus of her attention, I believe she could, he could have expressed himself and um, she could have actually done her job. Thank you. Dr. Fogger, what signals did this nurse miss? Where to start? Mm -hmm. Aside from the fact that she, as Dr. McGinnis said, was so tuned into her own issues and missed all of the signals he was sending, his hopelessness, his feeling alone, as Dr. McGinnis mentioned, um, the overwhelming pain and the constantness of it, and in the senses that he asked for pain medication and that's all he wanted and she wouldn't even give him that. So she just kind of essentially left him with nothing. Did you share her concern about him becoming addicted? That was kind of ridiculous. Yeah. His becoming addicted when he is terminal cancer is really not the point. Of course not. It's pain management and the fact that she even says this is just kind of startling. Yet I have heard such things. Chris, on your unit, what do you do when you think a, a patient is suicidal? Um, those patients who exhibit the signs as within the, in, within the video, um, they're asked directly if they are having thoughts of suicide or homicidal ideation. Um, they are asked if they have a plan if they answer yes to, the, to determine the imminence of the danger to themselves. As Amy said, it, a mental health consult is placed and that patient is immediately placed on a one-to-one -one observation in which they have someone supervising them, a licensed personnel supervising them at all times, and then mental health will come around and speak with the patient and evaluate their situation and place them in an inpatient situation if necessary. Thank you, Chris. 
Well, let's take a look at this same scenario and see if this can be done in a more therapeutic manner. My name is Frankie and I'll be your nurse today. How are you feeling? I'm feeling like somebody with pancreatic cancer. It's spreading everywhere fast. How do you think I'm feeling? Well, I can only imagine. The pain must be terrible. Can you tell me exactly where the pain is? Where it's most intense? It's, it's everywhere. I swear it's gotten to where every single part of my body hurts. Then we need to look at different treatment for you. I'll speak with your doctor about that right away. A anything specific you can tell me would be a big help. All I know is that what you've been giving me used to work, but in the past day or so, it's not been doing anything. Well, that is helpful information. See, anything like that, because we know you're in serious pain, and all of us here want to help you in any way we can. Is there anybody we can get for you? Someone you want to talk to? You mean like the chaplain? For example, yeah. I don't want to listen to any chaplain talk. I want to talk to my son, my ex-wife, anybody. They haven't been up here to see you? <laughs> Why would they bother? They know I'll be dead soon and won't bother them anymore. Well, you do sound defeated. The pain in your body may not be as bad as the pain in your feelings. Maybe. No, I don't know. Well, tell me about the divorce. That must have been awful. After all I went through in Afghanistan, I thought nothing could hurt me anymore. But when she told me she couldn't live with me anymore, I know I was angry a lot, that I yelled, made threats all the time, but I worked hard to support them. Never cheated on her. Even over there, I was true to my wife. Now it all seems so pointless. You feel like you did all that for nothing. Exactly. What have I been living for? What is there left to live for? Now, it concerns me to hear you talking about giving up. Have you had any thoughts of hurting yourself? What do you mean? I mean ending your life. Yeah, I've thought about it. Do you think you would act on it? Not while I think there's any, you know, any hope. Well, I can tell you love your son and his mother very much. I'm sure you'd like to see them again. I do. God, how I love them. I never told them, either of them. Never showed them how much. So, we need to keep you well enough to have time in your life to do that. Would you like that? Yeah, I'd like that. Okay, thanks everyone for helping with this psychiatric simulation video. I hope you viewers have enjoyed it, but more importantly, I hope it has caused you to think about your role in taking care of patients with mental health needs who are admitted to medical surgical units. This DVD has truly been a team effort. The team includes the Birmingham VA Hospital, the UAB School of Nursing, and the UAB Theater Department. To all of those entities, I say a well-deserved thank you. At this point, I'm turning it over to the VA nursing educator in your facility. Good night.